Hello students! Welcome to yet another entry in our fundamental series. Today we'll be talking about assembly code. Um, if you recall, when I talked about computer architecture, I showed you this diagram of what more or less a computer is, and I made the statement that um, everything that the CPU concerns itself with is binary encoder instructions, no matter what you originally write your code in. C, Python, even Ruby, if you're a crazy person, etc. Right, and then you're gonna end up running binary instructions on a CPU. And that CPU um, basically only accepts assembly as its true programming language, right? So, so assembly is a programming Repre language representation of basically binary code, uh, very straightforward mapping. Um, we're gonna talk about several concepts in uh, assembly language, really three uh, main ones that you need to know for this course, um, instructions, registers, and memory. Um, again, as a reminder, this fundamental series is supposed to be a review, maybe fill it, some small gaps you have in the knowledge. If this is really new material to you, then you are not ready to approach this course um, and you should go learn that before uh, taking it. Otherwise, let's roll. We actually start with registers. Um, registers are essentially very, very fast, very, very temporary and very, very expensive uh, places to store your data. I say expensive as in literally the financial sense. They're right there on the CPU, they take up space they um, need to be connected to everything. Uh, they're very hard to design in. And so historically, there have been very, very, um, there's been a, a shortage of them uh, in architecture designs. Uh, if we go back in time, if you go way back in time, um, you frequently see early architectures with like two registers, right? Um, the 8085, uh, when it came around, it was an 8-bit architecture that is the precursor to the precursor to, um, yeah, the precursor to the precursor to the uh, precursor to the modern AMD 64 architecture. Um, I probably still screwed that up. But anyways, it was an ancestor of x86, of uh, AMD 64 specifically. Um and it had seven general purpose 8-bit registers uh, that were all extended uh, and, and modified a little bit to 16-bit when Intel created 8086. So they took all these uh, seven 8-bit registers. They ended up with eight general purpose 16-bit um, registers. So you went from A, register A, to register AX, which is A extended. Then x86 came around and extended it further um, to 32-bit, um, uh, of course, right? And you went from AX to EAX. I guess extended, A extended. That's a guess. Don't quote me on that. Um, you went from x86 with 32 bits to uh, AMD 64. AMD took Intel's architecture and kind of put an extra 32 bits in it and created AMD 64. They also extended the amount of um, registers that we have all together. Um, and then you have like really extended a um, RAX. ARM also uh, a lot of registers, um, same sort of concepts, other architectures, MIPS, et cetera, registers. Um, general purpose registers are there to hold general data. Some of them have uh, also, slightly specific purposes, the stack pointers that are bold and the, the, the frame pointers that are bold. So RSP, RBP, and AMD64, we'll talk about um, them in a second. Um, and on ARM, uh, R13 and R14 serve the same function. Um, there's also special registers with special tasks. For example, RIP is the really extended instruction pointer on AMD64. Um, R15 on ARM, uh, that's where the address of the next instruction is stored so that the CPU um, can uh, retrieve it. Uh, generally speaking, you don't uh, interact
interact with these instructions directly, uh, although that varies the, the level of direct interaction with these instructions, sorry, with these registers, uh, like the instruction point registers varies by architecture. Um, there are also various extensions that add other specialized registers. Uh, X87 used to be a coprocessor to the X86 in the very, very early days that added floating point support, floating point registers and operations and so forth. Uh, multimedia extensions, um, added tons of uh, larger registers to do complex operations uh, in, in a modern machine, in a modern 64-bit, uh, you know, Intel or AMD processor, you have registers that are up to like 512 bits in size. Uh, it's pretty crazy stuff, but we'll focus here mostly on the general purpose registers and actually in the rest of the class, we'll focus mostly on 64-bit um, AMD or slash Intel architecture. All right. Um, these general purpose registers, by the way, can all be accessed partially. Um, you have a register RAX. You can access its uh, lower 32 bits using EAX. That's why I went through the whole history lesson, of course, not just for fun, although it is fun. You can access 16 bits, the lower 16 bits using AX. You can access the lower eight bits using AL and then the, the, the higher eight bits using AH or slightly higher, right? Like it shows on the slide. Um, due to a historical oddity of backwards compatibility, um, a choice made by AMD when they were creating AMD 64 is that accessing EAX in any way, modifying it will wipe out the top 32 bits of, of RAX. Uh, this is annoying because it doesn't hold true for AX or AH or AL. You can access those independently without messing up the rest of the register. It's extremely annoying and you will spend um, at least one hour of your life screaming at your computer because your shell code doesn't work um, or your rock chain doesn't work or something only to realize that you forgot about that. So just be ready. Um, RAX isn't the only one, of course, that can be partially accessed. Um, more or less every general purpose register can be partially accessed, but only um, A, C, D, and B, RAX, RCX, and so forth, um, can be um, accessed with their um, the high byte of the low 16 bits. Cool, so those are registers. That's where we store our data temporarily. Again, when we run out of registers, um, which happens more frequently, the less registers you have to work with, you have to spill them out to memory, which is an annoying process. But you know, the compiler, of course, does all this for you, unless you're handcrafting assembly. All right, let's talk about instructions. Instructions um, tell the uh, CPU what to do. Um, and uh, they generally, uh, they, they take several different forms, which we'll talk about individual instruction types um, in a second. Um, but generally they have an operator and several operands. So um, we'll talk about all of these in the future slides, but I'll point out a useful re reference um, is this uh, online x86 assembly uh, listing which is very cool. You can see um, the instructions, you can see what they um, look like uh, in terms of the, the actual um, binary and hexadecimal values. All right, so let's roll with instruction types. Type number one, data manipulation. Um, this is a fairly straightforward. I just saw a very embarrassing mistake on here, but we're gonna power through anyways. Um, I'll get to the embarrassing mistake. All right, so um, a couple of different ways to um, uh, manipulate data, you know, many, many different ways. I'll go through a couple as high level examples. Again, this should be review. You should have spotted the mistake on this slide. If you didn't, go learn more assembly. Um, as a, a quick note, Everything here and everything in this course is going to be using Intel assembly syntax for uh, AMD64. There are two assembly syntaxes. One is correct, one is wrong. The one was written by, uh, created by Intel. It's the, the syntax that Intel uses. Another one 
created by AT&T, or at least it's called the AT&T syntax. Tell me when was the last time you used an AT&T um, chip, and uh, that should tell you which is the correct assembly format to use. Please don't use uh, AT&T assembly format. It's confusing. It's um, just the wrong way to go. Use Intel. So this is all in Intel assembly format. The rest of the course will be in Intel assembly format. Please use the right format. Anyways, in Intel assembly format, um, data flows mostly right to left. Uh, I'm mirrored in the video, so right to left. So we take in the first example, RBX, that's here, and we move it into RAX. Boom, nice and simple. This makes sense. In C, you would write RAX equals RBX right okay this this is a memory access we take rbx we add four to it this gives us a number we look in memory at the location referenced by that number if that number is uh if rbx is eighty thousand, and we add four to it we look at eighty thousand and four. we load eight bytes out of that 64 bits and we push it put it sorry we move it into rax um, there's a little bit of magic in this statement in that it knows to load um, 8 bytes because RAX is 8 bytes long. You can also explicitly give sizes. Um, but again, this is a high level review. If you don't know how to do that, please go um, learn assembly. Um, add ar arithmetic instructions. You can, of course, take RBX. Add it to RAX. Wait a second. I've been going backwards the whole time. So you can take RBX, add it to RAX, and store it in RAX. This is basically RAX plus equals RBX in the C equivalent. This is where my embarrassing mistake is. Mole is a multiplier, a multiplication. It only takes actually one R, uh, register argument. It multiplies whatever is an RAX by the argument and also stores the overflow in RDX. So this, ignore this RDI, um, this will do RAX uh, equals RAX times RSI. And of course, multiplication of two 64-bit numbers can produce a much larger number than 64 bits. All that overflow goes into RDX. Um, ink RAX increments RAX by one. Ink the memory uh, location pointed to by RAX increments that memory, uh, the, the value in that memory. This should all be reviewed, just a couple of high level examples on what data manipulation instructions can look like. Um, I forgot, I should have probably put in a, a data store instruction. The, this, this reads uh, data from memory. If you just reverse these um, two uh, operands, you will be writing RAX into RBX plus four. All right. Let's move on. Control flow instructions. So control flow is determined by conditional and unconditional jumps, right? If the same way you have an if statement in C or you know when you have an if statement in C, it gets compiled into some conditional and conditional jumps. If you have a function call, it gets compiled into a call instruction. When you return, that's a ret instruction. Um, X86 or MD64 assembly, supports a number of um, conditional jump types. Um, you can jump if something is, is signed, so negative. You can jump if uh, two values are equal, and generally you do a comparison and then um, the jump. So if you have this jump, JB means jump if below right here. So this is an unsigned less than as opposed to uh, less than, which is signed, right? Um, We'll talk about um, two's complement uh, and, and signed and unsigned toward the end. Um, so uh, this says jump below some location, but jump below what? You know, there's no uh, condition here. Well, the condition is actually checked earlier and saved, and this uh, the conditional jump uses it right let's see how this works there's actually a special register um, called the flags register 
It exists on x86, on AMD64, on ARM, um, and uh, this register has a bunch of single bit flags that are updated by arithmetic operations and, and certain other um, types of instructions. So for example, the compare instruction in AMD64 does a subtraction, discards the result, but updates the um, various flags. The flags are, for example, the zero flag. Is the result zero? So comp rex rbx, if rex and rbx are equal, the zero flag will be set to one. Then a resulting je for jump if they were equal checks if the zero flag is one. Fairly straightforward, right? And that's how it, it, it works. And by combining these different flags, you can actually tell um, a lot of different conditions. So if you do an rex uh, minus rbx the, with a compare or with a subtract, if you don't want to discard the result, you can also do that. Um, it'll set you know the sign flag and the zero flag. You can add, you can look um, for conditions where, um, for example, jump less than or equal, the zero flag should be one, um, or the sign flag is not equal to the overflow flag. I'm not gonna go through and, and examine the meaning of this because also it takes a little bit of preparation on my part. Um, but if you're interested, you can go um, read further into this. It's a fairly clever way of um, doing these sort of conditional checks and jumps. Um, that's how conditional control flow works in uh, x86, AMD64, ARM, and so forth. I mean, ARM is a little different, but concept's the same. All right, finally, um, I think this is the last part of the type of instruction we'll talk about is system calls. All programs have to interact with the outside world. Um, and this is done primarily via system calls. So each um, uh, interaction is uh, done this way, right? Each system call. A system call is a dispatch into operating system functionality where the program asks the operating system to do something for it. Right. Um, when you trigger a system call, your program stops, the OS kernel takes control, carries out the request, and then returns to your program. Um, on AMD64, you create a system call by setting REX to a system call number, um, by storing um, arguments in RDI, RSI, etc., according to the calling convention. We'll talk more about calling convention in a sec and by using the syscall instruction and boom. Then from outside, if you want to debug shellcode that's doing um, system calls incorrectly, you can use strace. So let me um, show you what that uh, might look like. All right, here we are. Um, Actually, let me bring on up another view. There we go. This over here on the top right is a Linux syscall table as maintained by the great uh, Ryan A. Chapman. Um, Ryan A. Chapman uh, contributed this to the world and I look at it almost every day. It is a table of all of the system calls in Linux as of some old, relatively old now version, but still relevant. Um, and their uh, various arguments and so forth. Um, I have it linked on the next slide, but um, actually let me, let's go to the next slide. So um, it, the link is right down here if you wanna follow along. Um, there are a lot of syscalls. I'm gonna demonstrate uh, mostly the exit syscall um, right now and then maybe a couple of other ones later, but honestly, you should know all this so maybe we won't demonstrate them. All right, let's look at a simple program that we're gonna write from scratch that I actually already wrote from scratch called exit. There's some boilerplate for the assembler this is, it says, okay, the start, the entry point is gonna be right here, or there is a global uh, 
symbol called an entry point. It's going to be right here. Um, we're using Intel syntax and we can just compile this with GCC or you can also just assemble it and so forth with um, different uh, sub components of GCC, but we just use the big GCC. We have to not link in libc. All right, and now we can just execute it, right? So what does this do? It moves 16 to RAX. Uh, what is syscall 60? Syscall 60 is exit, and it takes one argument through RDI, which is the error code. That argument, we gave it 42. Um, so if we do check the return value, this is how you check the return value of the previous um, program in bash. There it is, 42. <clears throat> we can also S trace this and we can see that it does some setup um, wherever that happens. Um, and then it does the exit. Cool. So, um, it's interesting that, oh, so this is a shared object. Let me see. Can we do this? And then that's right. Boom. All it does is exit. Awesome. Cool. Okay. So, uh, depending on the order you watch these, uh, videos, you might understand what happened here. Um, in the Linux process lifecycle, you will understand why this was different from this because of the difference between this and that. All right. Or specifically that. Cool. Um, let's, uh, roll onwards. All right, so that was system calls. Um, let's move on to um, memory. I'm gonna go at a very high level of um, the kind of several different types of memory, um, but really mostly we're gonna cover the stack. Um, so in, um, um, AMD 64 and most modern architectures, there's a place in memory called the stack, which is responsible for storing a number of things. It stores um, the, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. One second, I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that, I am back. Um, all right, so memory. Um, the stack fulfills a number of functions. You should already know this. If you do not, please go look up and study what the stack does um, in a uh, x86 assembly. Um, essentially, uh, it tracks the call stack. So whenever you call a function, the return address to your code, to the instruction that that function should return to gets pushed onto the stack. And when you return from a function, it gets popped off of the stack. Um, it The stack also contains local variables. That's where the base pointer and the frame pointer or the base pointer and the stack pointer come in um, to track where in the stack you currently are and where in the stack your current function um, kind of ends its uh, allocated space. Um, uh, the stack provides some scratch space to allocate, to, to alleviate register exhaustion. Um, again, uh, more of an issue on uh, x86, but you still save off a lot of registers because of calling conventions as we'll discuss in a second on other architectures as well. Um, and you of course run into uh, register exhaustion everywhere still. Um, and uh, the stack on x86 is always, on 32-bit x86, is always used to uh, pass function arguments. On other architecture, it is still used to pass arguments to functions that take a lot of arguments. 
Um, all right, relevant registers on um, AMD 64 is RSP and RBP. Relevant instructions, push and pop. Push, write something to the stack, pop, reads it off of the stack. You should also know, you should already know that the stack grows uh, backwards. Uh, the way that I demonstrate the stack is right to left where, um, or the way I demonstrate memory in class is right to left and the stack grows to the left. Left is zero, right is FFFFFFFF in, in hexadecimal. Um, it is, the reason for that is other historical oddities, but that's where we are today. Um, all right, let's uh, move on to other mapped, uh, other uh, types of memory. I mean, it's all one big memory. Uh, AMD64 is not uh, segmented. There are no special memories or anything like that. Um, but uh, memory is used for other things than the stack. Uh, we'll talk about uh, dynamically allocated memory in a future module. You don't necessarily have to worry about it yet. Um, but it will feature very prominently. So memory can be mapped, unmapped, um, more or less at will, and is frequently in normal operation of a program. Um, you can also have files mapped into memory. Um, I'll discuss that a little bit in terms of uh, memory, uh, shared memory in uh, the Linux uh, lifecycle um, lecture. That's also in this fundamentals um, series. All right. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that, uh, on most modern architectures, uh, data is stored backwards. Um, as in if you have an eight bit, uh, uh, um, an eight byte integer that is, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, OX, 0102, 0304, which is not. Uh, sorry, I'm tired. Uh, let me get a drink of water. One sec. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. So, NDNS. Again, let's really quickly cover this. If you were to store the value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in hexadecimal at, loca at memory location OX100 in x86 or default configurations of ARM um, or modern defaults on MIPS and PPC even now, um, it would get stored backwards as OX67452301. So the bytes are reversed, not the bits, the bytes. Why does this happen? Um, there's a number of potential theories. Um, one idea is um, historically you um, were interested in um, the least significant bits more frequently in algorithms. I don't know if this is true. And because memory used to be read sequentially out of very, very slow medium, such as uh, punch cards or, or drums or something like that, um, it was faster to get at the early memory um, at the least significant bits first. I don't know if that's true. I read that uh, somewhere. I've um, also read arguments that it is easier to address different sizes, for example, in an array. Um, uh, if you want to read something, cast something to a char or a short, it's just much easier to make that calculation if it is at the beginning of the um, memory space for uh, the um, uh, value. Um, I've also heard that it made uh, backwards compatibility easier. What are the real reasons? I'm sure they're out there somewhere, but um, they're not in this lecture. But a couple of speculations are in this lecture. All right, let's um, move on to... Um, the next concept, signedness. So um, there's this tricky um, question of how to store the fact that a number is positive or negative. Um, I showed you an instruction that said add RAX RBX. 
Is Rex a positive number? Are uh, Ax a negative number? Who knows? Um, or how do we specify? So one idea, an early idea was to use a signed bit. So you say, okay, um, you uh, have the first bit in a register or whatever, or in any value says whether it's negative or positive. Um, let's have an example here with eight bits. Uh, we have it on the slide. Um, this all zeros followed by one one is a positive three and a one followed by all zeros followed by a one one would be a negative three. So this has a number of drawbacks. One drawback is that you now have two different representation for zero, a positive zero and a negative zero. This is uh, mathematically weird and it complicates a lot of, of math. Um, another drawback is that all of your operations have to be, hello Petrie, uh, my cat walked back in. Uh, all your operations have to be signness aware. Um, this is uh, bad because uh, you have to be, uh, you have to complicate the uh, uh, implementation of every add, every subtract, etc. cetera. Um, as you can see, uh, depending on, uh, there's a bug in, here. oh yeah, 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 as you can see, for an unsigned um, 8-bit value, if you add a 1 to 255, you end up with a 0. If it's signed, you add a 1 to negative 127, you end up with negative 126. And you also don't want to have everything being signed because you lose um, quite a lot of range that you would be able to express otherwise. You lose half of it to that signed bit. Um, so a clever but very crazy idea is what's called two's complement. Um, the idea is this, we have one representation of zero. If you subtract one from that, you get negative one. If you're in unsigned world or 250, or sorry, negative one, if you're in signed world or 255, if you're in unsigned world, both of them use OX, uh, FF as in uh, the eight bit representation, all ones in, in uh, binary, right? Um, if you subtract one from that, you get in binary one, 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 one with one zero or in hexadecimal OXFE, that's negative two now, right? Um, the advantage of this is that arithmetic operations don't have to be sign aware and we have one zero again, right? So um, adding a one to uh, OXFF is the same regardless of whether OXFF represents 255 or negative uh, 127, um, or, or, or in, actually in this case, negative one. Um, the disadvantage is it's a little crazy, it's a little bit weird to wrap your head around. You should have already had your head wrapped around it, um, but uh, it's a kind of a pain dealing with you know the values of negative numbers until you learn to adapt. The benefit of two's complement is we usually only have to really care about signedness during conditional checks. And that's done, if you recall, using the signed bit um, for, uh, and the specific uh, conditional jump of, you know, jump less than instead of jump below. Less than is signed, below is unsigned. Cool, Let's see what else we got. Calling conventions, we're getting close to the end. Um, calling conventions. Um, are important because when you call a function, you pass arguments uh, according to some agreed upon way, right? On x86, you push arguments in reverse order to the stack, and then you call, which uh, pushes the return address onto the stack. And when the function returns, it puts the return value in EAX. This is uh, the standard calling convention of x86. There are other ones. Um, this is like the, the, the typical Linux x86 um, STD call um, calling convention, but you, um, hold on, Petri. I'm trying to record here, man. My cat is fairly old and uh, has trouble climbing onto the couch. Anyways, uh, sorry about that. Um, we're not gonna be using 32-bit x86. It's old school. There's no reason to ever interact with it. Not really. Um, so 
we will be using AMD64, the Kong convention. Um, in Linux, for um, at least, is first argument in RDI, second argument in RSI, third argument in RDX, fourth in RCX, then R8, R9, boom. You go, um, return address gets put on the stack, and then when the function returns, the return value is um, put into RAX. Um, ARM is actually a little interesting. Uh, ARM has a register where it puts the return address instead of uh, uh, putting it on the stack. Um, but the point is, there are these conventions and they're followed. Um, actually, where the return address goes is not part of a calling convention. It's part of the architecture. It's what the call instruction does. But where the return value is, um, is part of the calling convention. Um, uh, it's very important to understand that registers are shared between all functions, essentially in your uh, process, in your in your thread. Actually, um, this means that when, if you're using a bunch of registers in your main function and you call into libc, uh, libc needs to use registers too, and it assumes that it can use certain registers haphazardly. There's a contract an agreement where certain registers are caller safe, certain registers are callee safe. This is part of the calling convention. On AMD64, um, RBX, RBP, R12, R13, R14, and R15 are what's called callee safe. If your code calls into a library function, the compiler will make sure that your code saves those uh, registers on the stack before making the call. All of the registers, the um, Oh, sorry, the other way around. Um, all these registers are ones that should not be messed with by code that you call. So when you call into libc, if libc needs to use these registers, rbx, rbp, and so forth, it will save them, it will use them, and then it will restore them before returning. All other registers are up for grabs. It can clobber them at will. RAX is nearly guaranteed to be clobbered because that's the return value of the function. All right, um, we've gotten to, um, with Petri's help, we've gotten to the end of uh, this assembly um, refresh. Um, I have a couple of useful uh, resources. One interesting resource is Rappel. It is a um, neat, um, basically uh, what, what appears to the user as an assembly interpreter. Uh, let me show this to you real quick. Um, here is our um, terminal. So let's, uh, what is going off my terminal? Let's use Rappel. Um, here's our state of our uh, emulated CPU. We have our various flags. Um, and they're here combined into this guy. Um, we have uh, our registers and so forth. And here I can do stuff like move RAX, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And here it is. This is what changed. Uh, the, um, the, the red is, is what changed. I can do stuff like test RAX, RAX. Okay, nothing changed. If I test RBX, RBX, so this does a bitwise and, and updates flags, I have stored the zero flag because RBX is zero. And we can see that that test results in ZF being one. Um, Repel has some limitations. You'll notice RIP doesn't seem to make sense at all. It started out at 4000, that's fine. It can start out wherever the you know binary that it's emulating is loaded. But it keeps um, basically uh, being equal to the 400 plus the size of the instruction you just executed. What it does is it assembles your instruction. What it does is it assembles your instruction, puts it there in memory, executes it, and stops afterwards. Um, it's very useful to figure out what exactly an instruction um, does. 
I'm trying to remember how to, yeah, it has some uh, help commands. You can, for example, read um, and write memory. Um, and let me show you actually, if we move this into RAX, push RAX onto the, the stack and let's read. So RSP is pointing to three, three for some reason. Let's read from this eight bytes of, well, something broke. Um, that's lame. Maybe it's not mapped. Yeah, it is not mapped, in fact. For some reason, RSP got messed up. Okay. All right, something is weird with Rappel and the stack possibly. Um, anyways, you can play around with uh, assembly instructions. You can do, for example, my awesome mall. So if we, I will show you that RAX is what um, mall ends up going into. So if we do put one into RAX and 42 into RSI and we do mall RSI, you see this is 42. Um, so the slides were wrong. Mall just takes one register. Cool. Um, this is more or less all that I have for you for, I mean, it is all that I have for you for the assembly um, refresher. Remember, this should have been a refresher. You should know assembly to do well in this course. You're going to have to write it. You're going to have to read it. You're going to have to make it appear out of thin air in otherwise uh, complicated scenarios. So make sure you know assembly. I will see you later in this foundation series and in the rest of the course. Good night.